Let's get started. We've got a lot of we've got a lot of ground to cover. This is where the rubber meets the road segment. And so, gentlemen, my encouragement to you is be pithy. I want you to bring this down because we're going to leave here. Many of us are here because we wrestle with these issues at home. So I want practical, I want helpful so that we can go back to our churches and engage in a loving, truth-telling sort of way. So we depart from here. We're loaded with great teaching and theology and wonderful expository preaching. And it's big, but these days with vines being six seconds long, I need, I need short because people have short attention spans. I know. I'm one of them. So how do I keep this, all that we have seen, all that we have heard, how do I keep this from getting into my church? <laughs> that was pithy. That was very pithy. Let's go on. We're gonna, we might be done soon. Should let the vendors know. What was that? Was that short enough for you? Yes, it was. <laughs> it was really tight. What do, what do well, I? What are the safeguards? Yeah, um, I, I will. I would be obviously coming at it from a pastoral perspective. I would say, rather than create a groundswell at uh, the level of your friends that raises distrust in the leadership, I, I think the right thing to do would be with a humble heart to go to the leaders, the pastors, your teachers, pastoral staff that you know, and sit down with them and share your heart and even give them a copy of the book. Um, and I say that because the arguments in the book are uh, in the form that God delivered His message, written down, black ink on white paper, frozen, you can analyze it. You can compare it. You can contrast it. You can memorize it. You can think about it. Um, if, if you just take the impressions of this week, uh, they might, they could be misrepresented. You could get caught up a little bit in, in the emotion and not be able to make the case. But uh, I, I, that's why the book is so very important. And I, I would, in kindness and with humility and patience, put the book in the hands of the leaders of the church or the folks that are responsible for your pastoral care and say, this is what's on my heart. Could you read this and then could we talk about this? I think when um, that's a way to give honor to those who are over you in the Lord, uh, as we're instructed to do. Uh, you know, the last thing that I would want is someone to leave this conference and go and overturn a church and, and, and be become revolutionary and make life difficult for pastors and leaders in a church. And then I get the blame for that, for, you know, creating havoc. I get enough blame for creating havoc anyway. I don't mind the havoc that the truth creates, but I think handling truth, as we even heard again this morning in Paul's instruction to Timothy, with great patience and instruction. And I think you want to start at the top, leaders, elders, shepherds, pastors, and let them have the opportunity to read it and think it through and then dialogue with you before you invade the church like some kind of uh, alien um, and shake things up. How could, my experience is a lot of pastors, they're busy studying, counseling, and they perhaps, you know, I've got a lot of free time and I can be on the internet a lot looking at stuff and you see all of this stuff going on and you get a sense of how big it is. How do I help the pastor, the elder to recognize this is something, while it may not be entering the church in its blatant form, is making its way through the cracks or can make its way through the cracks. How do I elevate their understanding and potential concern over this? You, you first have to have a platform, a legitimate platform to do that with your pastor. If you're not someone who, who has, has encouraged him and come alongside him and got to know him, uh, then you don't really have a good platform to do that. So you need to, you need to do that as a church member anyway. Know your pastor. Encourage your pastor. Uh, be a friend to him, and then you have a platform to correct his theology. The worst thing that happens in churches is it, churches are filled with people who are on the periphery. They attend uh, and sit on the sidelines and only approach the pastor ever if they want to criticize. And there's, there's nobody in the world responds well to criticism like that. So, so 
do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And starting with your pastor, especially if you have a concern about him and want to criticize him, you need to do it in a way that, as John said, honors his place as the man God has put uh, in the teaching role in that church. And I think, Todd, just to add, because this is where we're going today, there are a lot of pastors who uh, don't know where they are on this, and they haven't addressed it, and they've allowed all kinds of things to go- come together in the church that they've never thought about it critically. And part of the reason for that is no one has dealt with it. Already on the Internet, I'm being hit pretty hard um, because this is some kind of a fixation with me. This is some kind of a, of a long-term sort of enduring obsession with me. And I, and I remind people that we've had... Uh, We've had uh, forty-some years at Grace Community Church, and we have never had a conference like this. Never. Uh, this is not an obsession. And these criticisms started coming two days in. I-, I think there are a lot of people just don't know what they think. Some of the leaders that you're going to talk about today, and we're going to hear from in these video clips, admit that they don't know what to think. They don't know what to do with this. So that's why the book is so important because it makes a very thoughtful, very sound biblical theological case. And I think that's where you need to start. Put it in their hands. And, and if they don't have the desire to even read it, uh, they have to face the fact that that's being irresponsible for the shepherding of the flock. Uh, that, that's why I think the book is, aspect of it is so important. Okay. In a, in a sentence, again, don't hit the pastor after church. She's done preaching. Hey, you really need to get on this Jesus culture business and walk out the door. But if I had to say in a, in a sentence pithily. What do I say to the pastor to say, I'm giving you this book because what? Why am I doing this? Why am I giving them this book that will get him to go, I think I need to read this thing? You know, the way I would approach it, and uh, I think it's pretty simple, is uh, this is a deep spiritual burden to me. This is a matter of prayer uh, for the church around the world and for our church and for you and for the people in our influence. This is um, Psalm 16, uh, zeal for your house has eaten me up. The reproaches that fall on you are fallen on me. Uh, This is an ache in my heart. This is of deep concern to me. And I'd love to know if you share that concern, would you be willing to read this? Great question. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah, it's not, you need to read this and believe this. Read it. Tell me what you think. Excellent. All right. I see some of this entering into my church, whether it's the music, uh, prophesying, hearing from God, and, and, I, and I'm, I know that it's in there. Is there ever a point where I can determine the church has crossed a line and it's time for my family to go elsewhere? Thank you for pondering that. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a really complex question. Because every situation is different, and, and a lo- I would have to ask a barrage of questions Principalist. before I would counsel anyone on that, starting with, you know, what, what are the other churches in your area like? How did you end up in this church? How long have you been there? Uh, you know, tell me what specifically your concerns are and all. Uh, in the broad sort of principle category, I would say any, any church whose leadership has shown a willful... Um, uh, failure to follow Scripture as their authority, I'd be inclined to encourage you probably to find a better church. Uh, uh, if it's just that you don't like the taste of music, you know, that you, you think that there's too much percussion in the, in the songs or whatever, I, I'm, I'm less likely to encourage you to move on. Um, and a lot of it depends on, you know, what other churches are in, are in your area. When people come to me with that question, my first thought is not, you know, how do we get you out of this mess, but w- what is there in your church right now that you could do to exercise your spiritual gift to try to take that church from where it is to where it ought to be? Because there aren't any perfect churches. If you're looking for a perfect church, you're going to be frustrated. And when you find that perfect church, don't join it because you'll mess it up. <laughs> so, so... So, I mean, those are the big principles. Uh, But my first question is, and the way I wish people would think is, what what is there in my spiritual giftedness that I could do to start to influence this church in the right direction? And if that's an utterly hopeless cause, then we can talk about maybe you ought to leave that church. 
And I think there's a biblical model that, that uh, has always been helpful to me. If you were in Asia Minor at the end of the first century and you were in Ephesus, and Ephesus as a church had left its first love, well, where did you go? You had nowhere to go. That's, that's the only church. Or, or if you were in any of those other churches except Smyrna and Philadelphia, you had epic issues going on to the degree that the Lord was going to remove the candle and, and judge the church. But repeatedly our, the Lord said to the church, blessed are those who have not soiled their garments. I think there, there are times when you're there. And uh, you're, you're there like a believer in a marriage with an unbeliever. You're, you're the source of divine blessing on that. Uh, the, 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 the people are blessed through you because you're receiving the blessing from God because of your faithfulness. So I, I, think, uh, I think it's important to understand that there were most times in church history people couldn't run from place to place to place to place to place. And that, and that was not only in the New Testament era but long after that. I mean, see yourself throughout the history of the church and ask where did the true believers go? I mean, it was not uncommon for them to be stuck even in Roman Catholicism before there was a breakout. Uh, so I, I, I think, you know, we can't, can't treat this like consumers. And another thing to add to that is this. Leadership in the church these days changes very rapidly. I don't know what the average stay of a pastor in a church is, but it's probably two or three years. Um, people who run under one pastor may regret it when the Lord in His goodness gets them another one. Uh, you you, you want to be sure that you don't run uh, before the Lord makes a change that could be to your blessing and to your benefit. So I think patience in that situation, as Phil said, using your gift, realizing that God has you there for a purpose. And then one other thing. Uh, the Lord still has those churches in His hand. Uh, if there are believers there, they belong to Him, and he, they're in His hand, and he, he has the best for them. Having said all of that, I would say if there's a more faithful church preaching the Word of God faithfully in sound doctrine and God is blessing that church, go there. All right. I go home and I see ten things. The Music is hypnotic. They're calling down the fire. The pastor is telling the congregation on occasion, God, you know, he really felt a nudging, prompting, liver shiver. And you see a lot of things that are causing you to go, yikes, how do I begin to approach it? Each and every issue, do I deal with every single person? What is the best way to approach it if I'm sensing my church is a bit of a mess? You're doing it again, Mount Rushmore. We need some answers here, people. Well, uh, perhaps let me, let me uh, break my silence there and say something. <laughs> um, I think we need to, uh, to appreciate the fact that ultimately uh, the behavior is a fruit of a person's belief. So you've got the fruit and the root. Instead of simply beginning to fight the, the fruit, the behavior, uh, it, it will be important for, for you to, to help with the understanding, uh, to, to help with the, the doctrinal roots from which all this is coming. Um, an obvious example is if you look at uh, the Pauline epistles, it's, it's always he, he deals with the doctrinal and then says, therefore, you know, this is wrong or therefore, this is the way you ought to live. Um, and therefore, the, the, the issue that was raised earlier on in seeing what your gifts are, participating positively, warmly in the context of the church, um, winning the right to be heard as you are uh, helping people to un understand the gist of what the Bible teaches, um, I think gives you a good enough platform to enable individuals to begin to think. Uh, of course, depending on your position, if you're the church pastor, you have uh, a longer stretch, a bigger opportunity, if you are not the leaders, you are closer to uh, the pastor to help with the changes. Um, if you are further down the line, you really need a lot more patience. So that's what I would say. 
This is a very important point, and I would just go so far as to say the most extensive doctrinal statement that I have ever seen is the Grace Community Church doctrinal statement. It's the same doctrinal statement for the Master's College, the Master's Seminary, and Grace to you. I don't know how long, how long is it, Phil? Have you looked at it? It's a booklet, and it, it it's amounts an to like booklet yeah, 25, 24 pages, something like that. Um, I, I think it should be an absolute in a church that you have a highly defined doctrinal statement. You may even go back to the Westminster Confession, Shorter Catechism. You may go back to a Baptist Confession, something like that. Uh, you know, and while we sometimes uh, wonder about confessional Christianity, those confessions were the product, as we, as we heard from Steve last night, of 1,100 hours of diligent work by men who were scholars in the Word. And, and I think all churches should be able to go back to that. Uh, we, we're never at sea here because everything is defined in that doctrinal statement. And I think that becomes the anchor, that becomes the foundation that holds you. Uh, and I think, so go to a church leader and say, uh, Pastor, I'm concerned about our doctrinal statement. Have we really defined these things? What is, what is the church's position on these things? Are we working on that? Are we thinking about that? Could we help with that? Could, could, um, could somebody take a look at that? Could, could we get some people together to talk about that? Whatever it needs to be. But I think he's absolutely right. You've got to back up to that because the temporary view of, of fitting into the culture forces people to disregard that and just follow trends. And if you follow the trends, you're going to end up in the charismatic movement. Let, let, me, let me back up even one step further and say, you need to ask yourself, what are you doing in this church in the first place? If you came to this church because they have a better youth program or, or you like the music or whatever, and it's not the soundest church in your, in your community, there's a better church with, or there's a church with better teaching, but they don't have the youth program or the music you like or whatever. But so you decided to go to the bigger church, uh, you know, I don't know, for business reasons or, or something you liked better, even knowing that its doctrinal foundation was not as sound. What are you doing in that church? When you decide where you're going to take your family to go, you'd better choose the church with the best teaching, regardless of what, you know, their youth program, whether the youth program measures up to what the mega churches are doing. If, uh, if I could also say on behalf of Nathan, <laughs> could, I, could I suggest if I think we have a tendency to look at the church and go, oh, there's so much, and I want the whole ship turned around immediately, maybe find, start teaching Sunday school. Most likely they're not going to check on what you're teaching anyway, if it's that loosey-goosey. <laughs> and, and start teaching your group of six or eight and do what you can do to affect change. Maybe it's not correcting the whole ship, but it's at least getting involved with some folks to steer them rightly. Would that be wise? Good place to start? I was always taught that children don't speak until the elders have spoken, so um, just wanted to clarify that. <laughs> Good on you. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I think it's important to make sure that we're always bringing people back to the biblical text and that we're not allowing our own experiences or their own experiences to be the authority, but rather we are examining everything, our own thinking, their experiences, we're bringing it back to the text of Scripture. That's our authority. The reason we are cessationists is because we are convinced that that's what the Word of God teaches. And we then, we encourage people to go back to the text. And I think as long as we're bringing it back to the text, we're honoring the Spirit who inspired this Word. Uh, Todd, I want to just add one note, and I'll say more about this tonight. Um, the contemporary evangelical church has very little interest in theology and doctrine. So you're going to have a tough sell. It's about style. It's about style. And style is the Trojan horse that lets charismatics in the church. Because once you let the music in, the movement follows because it all of a sudden becomes common. 
Now we sound like the charismatics, we sing the same things they do, we start waving our hands the way they wave their hands, we're having the same kind of emotional feelings that they have. It's a small step from doing the same music to buying into the movement. So I think the tough thing is you're going back to a church that's kind of thinking like that. It's hard to make sound doctrine the issue when style is much more the interest of the leaders in the church. Yeah, and that's, I think that's going to be a lot of folks' challenge when they leave here. Gentlemen, what I'd like to do by way of rubber meeting the road here is I want to share with you some of the objections to this teaching, some of the objection to this conference, because I suspect these things will be some of the things that we hear if we go back and try to incorporate these or bring these things back. So these were some of the, the comments that were made prior to the conference and even during the conference through some tweeting, and I suspect these might be things that you also hear. Some people have been tweeting based on some of the clips that we shared yesterday, uh, some of the things that we saw with people writhing on the floor, the repetitive music, uh, some of the things that seem to most of us to be pretty outstanding, that those are simply the fringe elements of the charismatic movement. That is not who we are. Therefore, knock it off. Yeah, you know, Part of what the Strange Fire book talks about is that what people think is the fringe has actually become mainstream. And we talk about 120 million charismatic Catholics. We talk about 25 million oneness Pentecostals. Uh, John T. Allen in his book, Future Church, talks about the fact, it's based on the Pew Forum research that upwards of 90%, in some cases more than 90% of all Pentecostals in most countries around the world believe in the prosperity gospel. So when you just do the simple math, this is hundreds of millions of people who hold to a false gospel. It is the majority of the movement. So, but, they'll, but we don't do that. We're not falling on the ground. We're not trembling and kundaliniing. So this has nothing to do with me. What are yeah, we saying? But here's the problem. You're not doing it in your church, but your kids are listening to Jesus Culture music. So when Jesus Culture comes into the 16,000 seat deal and they go, they are falling down and they are doing that. And they're beginning to see those behaviors and join the mosh pit kind of mentality. And then it eventually, it, it, it's, it simply imports itself back into the church. I, I, you know, there's going to be resistance to that kind of thing in some places. But, but it crosses over. I mean, the, look, Hillsong is everywhere. Jesus culture is everywhere. It is marketed. It is spread like wildfire. I don't know who was telling me yesterday that 1,400 young people come into Redding, California uh, to be trained for a year to spread this stuff everywhere in that uh, Bethel church. And so, and they create events and they're in the name of Jesus and young people from your church go and, and they buy in and th there's, you, you have to draw the line before you get to the, to the entry point, I think, or you end up allowing that kind of behavior. Let me, if I could have the AV department queue up clip 007, 007. We've been saying, and I think rightly so, that Jesus Culture and other bands like this are kind of the entry drug, if you will, into this movement. I would like to share with us, however, that they don't wait to teach people after the Jesus, concert, Jesus Culture concert. There is indeed preaching and teaching that happens in the Jesus Culture concert, not to mention the theology inside of their music. So this is clip 007. Uh, this is Kim Walker of Jesus Culture describing her encounter with God. This is clip 007. If your kids go to Jesus Culture, this is what they're going to get. And that is the truth. <laughs> I can say that right now, where, where I'm living in my life, in this moment, in this season, just, just being here right now, this is the fruit of that moment. Those many moments, actually, long time ago of hours and hours of sitting and just waiting on God and just pressing in, pouring out my heart, pouring out my heart, pouring out all that I can on Him. 
Whether or not I heard anything or saw anything or had any radical encounter, I just kept saying, I know, I know that I will live in the fruit of this moment one day. And I kept pressing in. These are like those, the two keys, okay, for this connection, fighting for that relationship. No offense in the heart and pressing in, knowing that one day we'll live in that fruit of that moment. And I still do that to this day. Even now in my life, when I have those moments, I still tell myself, one day I will live okay, in the fruit of this moment. Okay, I'm going to ask the moment. AV department to put a stop on that, if you'd be so kind. I'm not sure why it, it didn't get to the, the part of the, the presentation there, so let me just tell you what, where she's going to. This seems to have been recorded a little bit sooner, so we'll save everybody the pain. Uh, she encountered God. Jesus appeared to her. She had a conversation with Jesus. She communed with Jesus. Um, he held her. Uh, this was her, her, what really launched her was her encounter with God. Now, she said it doesn't happen all the time, but it has happened throughout her life. And that was just a part of her presentation, her encounter with God. So leaving the critique of it aside, they're getting theology. She, they do teach. They stop and open up a Bible, and they do teach at the concert. And it's bad theology. I, I've seen that. One of my sons showed me that whole clip. It goes on for an hour and a half. That's yeah. an hour and a half long video. And uh, she's talking, what she's saying is that she lives basically from encounter to encounter. Mm -hmm. It's not about the Word of God or the truth of God. It's about her experiences and how she, she lives between these experiences. And she's definitely teaching, you said theology, I'd say deplorably bad theology. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and you're right, uh, that, that is the entry level for a lot of young people. Jesus Culture was the music group this year at Louis Giglio's Passion. John Piper was a speaker there. Uh, so this is not some far off extreme out on the fringe. This stuff is bleeding into the mainstream of our churches. You know, th this, is, this, this is classic marketing. <clears throat> make people discontent, make them feel like they're out of touch, out of date, out of style, out of mode. So you take a typical kid, put him in that environment, he is clueless about this kind of experience. What is she talking about? When I was in um, <clears throat> junior high, and you know, there was never a time when I didn't believe in the Lord, and I read Thomas a Kempis. I didn't even know what he was talking about. But I thought, you're missing something. You don't have it. I, I, I'd never had these mystical feelings of the presence of God. So I. Uh, I got uh, a book on prayer by E.M. Bounds. Remember that, Phil? And it, was, it got worse. What is this? Then I got, Tom will identify with this, Witness Lee. And I'm, here, I'm a junior high kid. I'm a high school kid. I'm basically your average football player, baseball player guy who just loves the Lord and is wondering if I'm missing everything. Um, I mean, they're, they're literally, they're literally dupes for this kind of thing. You take a kid who, who knows his life isn't right, who sees this kind of <clears throat> esoteric, almost transcendental kind of religious experience being portrayed before him. He has no idea what's out there. Um, he's not theologically informed. Uh, I, I can just tell you from my own personal experience, I read things about people who wore holes in a wooden floor from praying for so long in the same place, I couldn't comprehend that kind of behavior, couldn't even grasp it. And uh, fortunately, it, by, by the goodness of God, I was kept from that path into which a whole lot of other young people went even in those early years of my life. So I, I think it, it, is, it is a preparedness of their hearts that comes from knowing they're short of what real spirituality should be. And they know that. And they're, they get suckered into this kind of thing. And before they know it, they're caught up in it. And the emotional falsification, the, the illegitimate substitute they buy into. Uh, and, and they carry that back. <clears throat> and they go to the church and they hear people sing an amazing grace. And the preacher gets up and explains a few verses in Scripture. And they will think that he doesn't have it either, and they don't have it either, because they got it at the Jesus Culture deal. Let me ask for, uh, if I could, please, uh, clip number 23. This is very brief. Clip number 23. Remember, Jesus Culture, it is a ministry of Bethel Church in Redding, California. 
the senior pastor, he's, he's just passed the torch to his son, and now he's, I think, considered the international ambassador apostle, Bill Johnson. Uh, but this is clip 23. This is the church that they come out of and the type of teaching then that the kids find. This is Bill Johnson of Bethel Church. By the way, when you say that on the radio, would you be more precise? That's Bill Johnson. <laughs> yeah. You can tell the difference. You speak authoritatively. This is a big mush bomb is what this is. All right, this is, it is, a uh, Bill Johnson. Not everything that comes at us is God's will. We have confusion. One of our biggest areas of confusion in the church is con concerning the sovereignty of God. We know that God is all-powerful. We know that, that he is in charge of everything. But with that, we make a mistake in thinking he is in control of everything. There's a difference from being in charge and being in control. If you think he is in control of everything, then you have to believe that Hitler was his will, that he was just going to work it for his purposes. Now, that's, that's not all that subtle, uh, frankly. Uh, but that is just a little snippet of did, Bill Johnson. Uh, did you notice the absence of the Bible? Yes. Uh, this is Bill Johnson. Right. Bill Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, let me share some more of the objections uh, that I would like to share with you. Uh, hearing from God is not new revelation. You keep saying I should tack it on the book of Revelation. Hearing from God is not new revelation. Your response? Well, Wayne, Wayne Grudem says it is. So they define it as new revelation, and they will call it revelation from God. So to say that it's not would be a, a cessationist way of speaking, but, but the charismatics themselves actually do refer to it as revelation from God. And they'll say that the revelation is perfect, but then that the human instrument messes it up. The problem is in Deuteronomy 18 and all throughout Scripture, those who speak on God's behalf are required to relay that revelation accurately. If they distort it, they come under the condemnation of God's own requirements for those who speak on his behalf. Okay, so we would say to them, if God is talking to you, that is indeed revelation. All right? Okay? Any other? Well, yeah. What, what else would it be? What, what, if this is God giving you information, by definition, that is revelation from God. And, it, and if it's to you now, it's new revelation. And th th this is the folly of this movement. And then to say that it's okay for us to mess it up, right? It's okay for us to clobber it and uh, misrepresent it because we're fallible and it's fallible and God somehow works it out anyway. Uh, is, as we heard and we've heard several times, is to completely turn the idea of God's revelation on its head. Um, but of course it's new revelation. Now, what, what is so, so bizarre about it is there is no way to verify it. There is no way. And just because it isn't heresy, we're supposed to say it's new revelation. If it's not heresy, it's, it's new revelation. Um, but all things that God has deemed for us to know for life and godliness are already on the pages of Holy Scripture, and no new revelation is required or allowed. Uh, but for them to say it's not new revelation is ridiculous. If God's saying it, it's, it's revelation. When Sarah Young writes these books, Jesus is Calling, and she says, Jesus is speaking to me, and Jesus says this, and then writes the book in the first person, she is claiming these are the words of Jesus. All That's right. scary. People will say that, come on, we're talking about 500 million people here. I see good fruit coming out of people. They really do love the Lord. You're telling me this entire movement is condemned to hell. Everybody is, everybody is wrong? will show you the fruit. There's good fruit there. Don't you see it? Quit critiquing. Yeah, well, uh, I think the, the difficulty there is basically that you are putting the cart before the horse. Um, I mean, Roman Catholicism will show you some good fruit, especially out in Africa at a social level. 
They've put up schools, they've put up hospitals, which have benefited you know, entire nations. Um, but, but that does not therefore mean that Roman Catholicism is correct. And again, they are in their millions. So we, we need to always begin with what does the Bible say? Begin from that foundation. And then you have your therefore, what should be a consequence of that? And th that's where the error is. It's the fact that the Bible is, is very clear that with the foundation laid, the generations succeeding that are to expound the teaching that was brought forth in an extraordinary way through those foundational teachers, the apostles and New Testament um, prophets. Now, that's straightforward. Anybody, therefore, who begins to bring in another approach, wanting to lengthen that, is opening a door, a dangerous door, where in due season, the kind of things we've talked about here begin to be common fare. It becomes the regular diet. Those of you who've been exposed to regular teaching of God's word, you were sighing and groaning when you were hearing some of the things being said. A lot of the people who were sitting listening to some of these things, to them that's, that's it, it's life. After all, my teacher is, is the one who's teaching this, it must be correct. So I think let's always keep getting back to the basic principle. And it's not so much there's some good being done, look at it. It is what safe the scriptures. Bill. Yeah, let me say this about good fruit too. You, you can't always tell at first glance what's truly good fruit. I bought a bag of peaches just last month. <laughs> and, and seriously, when I got it home, when I got it home, uh, these are great looking peaches, cut them open, every one of them was rotting from the seed out. I think they'd been frozen or something. Spiritual fruit is the same way. Sometimes it looks good. But you have to analyze it. And what the real test of good fruit is the underlying core of teaching. That's what Conrad was saying. If it's not based on and, and, and centered on the truth, if the truth isn't built into it, it's not really good fruit. One of the critiques prior to the conference, and I'm sure after the conference, and it might be one that we, uh, let me just clarify this first, because uh, I just want to make sure I've got this right. You're a cessationist, is that correct? Okay, so what they will say is, you cessationists have no business making any sort of critiques about charismatics who are continuationists. This is not your house. You stay in your own house. Don't try to clean up ours. It's none of your business. Well, I've lived that. I mean, we live within five miles of the kind of uh, Pentecostal Mecca in this area, Church on the Way. Uh, we've had parallel years since I came here with, with that. And uh, the conversations that I've had sound like this. Uh, God has blessed John MacArthur. Imagine what God could do with him if he had the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I, I've heard that for years here. I've heard that for years. Um, he's not equipped to critique this movement because he's void of the Spirit. Um, so uh, there, there's nothing for me to say. Um, it, it's a frightening world to live in. Um, some, I don't know how many years ago, um, a new pastor was appointed to, the, to this church, and a prophet came. I think it was a Kansas City prophet, I think, came and laid hands on him, said he's going to be, this new pastor will be the prophet of the world. Uh, he's going to do miracles and signs and wonders and uh, going to spread around the globe. Uh, the prophecy took his hands off, he had a brain aneurysm, died, the pastor. I went to the funeral, no, just the, the, I went to the funeral. I said, what's going on? 
And the person that I spoke with, I, I was there for the funeral just out of respect and love for some of the folks there. I said, what, what's going on? He said, well, the prophecy was true, so the devil killed him. Uh, I would rather, you know, you'd like them to believe that we have the Holy Spirit here because it's true, all of us in Christ. But that, their perceptions are that far off. In other words, they not only misunderstand us, they misunderstand their own situation. So it, it's impossible apart from them coming to a biblical understanding. By the way, if you ever try to use this as a tactic to state, you know, why is it that certainly there's got to be some believers in this assembly, why doesn't the Holy Spirit show up in those ways in this community? And the response will be because the Holy Spirit is a gentleman and he is not going to come barging in where he's not invited. So that's why we don't act the way that they act because, yeah, we're saved, I guess, but the Holy Spirit is invited. And that's why it doesn't happen. Now, yeah, and that, fits the, that fits the control that supposedly the believer has over the powers, over the demonic powers and even over the Holy Spirit, like Benny Hinn. You know, he doesn't do anything until I say so. You know, if the best uh, charismatics, those who really do have a concern about the authority of Scripture, were, were actually critiquing their own movement and sounding uh, an adequate alarm to the people who follow them, we wouldn't have had this conference. But somebody needs to say this. I would like to try. Uh, we're going to have to do this somewhat quickly. Clips 15 and 25, if you'd be so kind. And this will have to kind of represent some of our friends. We would say that John Piper is a brother. We would say that Wayne Grudem is a brother. We would say, and so these are some biblical scholars that many of us perhaps have read and loved for years who are saying some things that are causing us to scratch our heads. And what I would like to focus on is we take a look at clip number 15, um, and then uh, let's just do clip number 25 for the sake of time. Clip number 25 for the sake of time. Uh, how then do we respond to these men? What do we do with these talking then about associations, with whom do we relate and associate, with whom do we break relationships with, where do we draw those lines. Let's start with John Piper, clip number 25, talking about speaking in tongues on a YouTube video. But I thought of tongues, and I said, I haven't asked for tongues for a long time. And so I just paused. I'm, I'm walking back and forth in my living room. Nobody, Talos is up in her room, Noel's at the gym. And I said, Lord, I'm still eager to speak in tongues. Would you give me that gift? Now, at that point, you can try to say banana backwards if you want to. <laughs> I used to sit in the car outside church singing in tongues. But I knew I wasn't. I was just making it up. And I said, this isn't it. I know this isn't it. But this is what they try to get you to do if, if you're in that certain group. And I, I just, I did everything to try to open myself to this and, and the Lord has always said to me without words, no, <laughs> no. But, but he never just said no. He always said, John Piper, I have given you a gift. I have given you the gift of teaching, of preaching, of shepherding. You shepherd the prophets. You shepherd the tongue speakers. I'm not going to give it to you. But I don't assume that's his last word. And so every now and then, I'm just going to go back to him like a child and say, a lot of my brothers and sisters have this toy, <laughs> this gift. Can I have it too? All right. Now, we could show clips, for instance, of uh, we had some of Wayne Grudem talking about some prophecies in his church where, for instance, there was a young lady who had been struggling with an illness. Four people approached the pastor and said, have a sense and that we've been given a word that she's going to die uh, so we prayed like crazy, and she didn't die, and we all rejoiced in that. Now, pastoral implications aside of that, Wayne Grudem, I don't know that there's anybody in here who doesn't have a systematic theology on their bookshelf. John Piper, we have all loved so much of his preaching. What do we do with these men when they say things like that? I think it's important to, to critique those comments honestly now i and i did as a matter of fact uh, respond to that very comment yesterday in my breakout session i had a couple of people come up to me afterwards and say well then because i also said look i love john piper i've benefited from him i've learned things from him 
uh, I'm, not, I'm not prepared to throw him out completely. And they said, no, you should. You just should. And um, my response to that is the times in which we are living are the theological parallel to the book of Judges, where every man does what's right in his own eyes. And, and there isn't a consistent voice. There's no king in Israel. There's no consistent voice in the church that, that you know, sort of polices all that stuff. Everybody's doing what's right in their own eyes. And it's not even considered politically correct to sit in a venue like this and say, this is wrong. That's, that's automatically deemed unkind, uncharitable, unloving. You can't disagree anymore. So everybody can say what they want. In a time when every man does what's right in his own eyes and nobody is willing to speak with a voice of clarity and say that's wrong, you're going to have men, lots of men, uh, in whom there's lots of good and, and some bad. And uh, the question I always ask people who say that, what would you say about Samson? Would you say, he's a good guy, you should follow him? And uh, most of us would say, I think, no, Samson made a wreck of his life, and yet he's in Hebrews 11. And I think the same thing about a lot of these men. This, despite what I would criticize and disagree with them, they're men of faith, and I think that deserves to be recognized. You know, I, th I think that is, with, with somebody like John Parper, that is a complete anomaly. That is just so off everything else about him. Um, I'm not talking about percentages. We, we, you know, we ask ourselves, it's not that he speaks in tongues. It's not that he prophesies. He's never, he has admitted that. Um, it's just that there's this anomaly in his mind that is open to that. And that's the way he's always stated that, that he's open to that. He's open to that. He, he's even made statements like, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not, I don't know exactly what to think about all of this. So um, that's far cry from the propagation side of it. And, uh, and so I look at this with him and even with Wayne Grudem, who's made such you know, immense contributions in so many ways, as an anomaly. And I don't know, I don't, nor do I need to know what, where the impulse for this comes from, where the influence comes from. Sometimes it comes from family. Sometimes it comes from a spouse. Um, you know, we, 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 we see that. We understand that. I don't, I don't know where these influences come from. But I do know the great body of work that John Piper has done is true to the faith. And uh, John is a friend whom I not only admire, but whom I love. And I, I don't know why on this front he has that open idea, but it is, it is not an advocacy position for the movement, and he would, he would uh, join us in decrying the excesses of that movement for sure, and even the theology of it. Uh, so. I, I think if we start shutting everybody down who's got one thing they're not clear on or, you know, we're, we're going to really find ourselves alone. Uh, and that's, that's going too far. Uh, I have no fear uh, that John would ever tamper with anything that is essential to the Christian faith, starting from theology proper all the way through. Uh, to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to be faithful to the Word of God as He understands it in a historical sense. Uh, how, to, how to explain anomalies like this? I have the same issue with my dear friend R.C. Sproul. You know, I want to say to him, why are you baptizing babies? <laughs> uh, uh, you, you always say the same thing to him. <laughs> right. He's a Reformed Baptist. But, and we say, it's not a, why I don't understand that. Everything else is so clear and and you know well thought out and biblically uh, defended and but I, I fully embrace the 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 range of his commitment and the impact of his ministry. So I think at, at this point this is where love comes in to embrace faithful men. And then when I look at myself, I say, look, I know I'm wrong somewhere. And if you can show me where, please show me, because I would change. But I know somewhere I'm, I'm, I'm wrong, because none of us uh, has a complete control of all truth. And I hope to have the same charity 
from them that that I would eagerly extend to them. So, if I hear a pastor say, reading from John Piper's work, I don't have to think that the pastor's tainted or a heretic because he quoted John Piper, who said on a YouTube video something about no, speaking. No, in no but I wish, and I'm going to say this a little bit later tonight. I wish they would see that they don't need to be unclear about this issue because the lack of clarity on this issue has given room to this movement. These guys give credibility to this movement by even allowing for it. All right. As, as we close, gentlemen, what I'd like to do, and, and Phil, we'll start, we'll start with you and make our way and try to keep this tight. We're going to leave here, and I suspect almost everybody is thinking about something in their church, a family member, their mom, and they're wondering just how to go about and what to do with all of this. Whatever the scenario is, they're going back and they're going to be addressing and confronting these issues. You would give them one piece of advice, one suggestion, and then we'll let you apply it as you see fit. Phil, what would it be? It would be immerse yourself in the Word of God. You know, you don't have to take my word for it, uh, and I don't ask people to change their minds the first time they hear me teach on something. Be like a Berean. Study the Word for yourself. And if you can coax your charismatic friends to, to really truly devote themselves to finding out what does Scripture teach about this, uh, then you're miles ahead, and they're on their way to abandoning some of these extremes. Nathan. Yeah, celebrate the true work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, don't allow the charismatic movement to replace a celebration of the true work of the Holy Spirit with counterfeits. The true work of the Holy Spirit is His work in salvation, His work in illumination of the Scriptures. And listen, when we go to the Word of God, we are sitting at the feet of the author of the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit is the one who has given us this book. So to go to the Scriptures is to go to the Spirit. Conrad. I think basically what's already been said, uh, sola scriptura, uh, keep that in mind. That's the foundation, everything else, pillars, and uh, you, you have the, the roof on top, but always remember the Scriptures. If any contradicts the scriptures, there is no light or life in them. And, and you can personalize that a little bit. Um, I think you, you need to say to people, show me from the Word of God why you believe that. Let's talk about that. I think if you pounce with all your Bible verses, you put them on defense. But if you ask them to explain to you from the Word of God why they believe what they believe and start the, the discussion. You can lead them into the Scripture. I think uh, they live with assumptions that have never been proven even to their own minds. So put the burden on them. The burden lies with them to prove their point. And I think if they're not willing to do that, if they're disinterested in that, if that's too much trouble or too much effort for them, then they need to face the absence of integrity in, in, in denying you that. So I, I'd put the burden on them encourage them, you, you want to understand why they believe what they believe, and you'd like them to show you why they believe that from Scripture and then be willing to discuss that with you. Might I toss on top of it, if you decide to confront somebody, might I encourage you, instead of attacking the teacher, attack the teaching? Because if you attack the teacher, you're touching God's anointed, you're going after perhaps their best friend, somebody that they really revere, and you are just in for a cat fight. Go after the teaching as opposed to the teacher. The second thing I might suggest is, as, as we've been hearing, I think rather grievously, the majority of these folks are caught up in a very wrong system. It might be starting, instead of debating eschatology, speaking in tongues, prophecy, gifts of wisdom, share the gospel with these folks witness to these folks, help them understand the true gospel and how magnificent it is. Third, I would add to that, I really think that a lot of people run to this movement because they've never been shown that Christianity is vibrant and vital and alive and that theology works. 
and that we need to be showing them, telling them, teaching them. No, let me show you. You think that theology is all stodgy. Let's take this theology and I'm going to show you what this does in your life so that they don't stop running for the experiential and the whimsical and the feelings-based, but the knowledge-based, knowing that it actually does something. And that, frankly, is exciting. And my final exhortation, if I might be so bold, is you're... In America these days, we think that we've got to write a best-selling book. We better have a TV show. That, that's the only thing that makes an impact. And we can not do something or be frustrated and just get out of the game or carp a lot because we just don't see this whole thing changing. It's not going to change overnight. And nobody in this room is going to be the one who accomplishes that. So what can you do? Where you are, think local church. Get plugged in. Volunteer. Teach the little kids, get the, you know, the little four-year-old armadillos, start teaching them, the little junior high group, whatever it is, plug in, start your Bible study, start mentoring. I see some, and it's lovely to see, some gray hair in this audience. Identify somebody younger and start mentoring them and do what you can do where God has called you to be. And I know that he's called you to be there because you're there. Okay? Don't be discouraged that the whole thing doesn't change. Do what you can do, and maybe God will be kind to show you a little victory here and a little victory there. And if we all do that, that's how God's kingdom marches on. Not with one big overnight victory, but with a million small ones as we go and we all be faithful to the gospel. So with that, Conrad, would you pray for us? All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity you've given us to think through a number of questions. We realize, O oh Lord, that in this short time, it would not have been possible to handle them to any meaningful depth. Yet we thank you that your Holy Spirit is with us, each one, and we have your word, and that therefore you continue to teach us, to guide us, to correct us, and even where we are stubbornly wrong, to rebuke us, that we might be fashioned after the image of Christ. Therefore, we pray that that which we have learned here, we might take to heart, and that which you will continue to teach us will build us to be better instruments in your hands. Dismiss us now, therefore, uh, from this gathering, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.